Encore presents The Bronte Boy by Michael Yates. Only a dream after all. But is not all of this a dream then? Do I really still sit here in my study as I did in my childhood? No, no, it is not a dream. I am here to work. As my father tells me. I must write my novel. Where is my novel? To which drawer did I assign it? I must find it. Here. Ah, oh, yes. Yes. Chapter three. He made no halt in his intrusion on the quietude of the hall. He was received by the lady of the mansion in the breakfast room. Breakfast room. The library, perhaps? It's more elegant. No, no. Breakfast is more intimate. No servant could have been so dull as not to perceive the change in their calm and sweet-tempered mistress. The dove-like eye now seemed troubled. The voice, with its gentle tone, now gave way to hesitation. Gave way to hesitation. Harboured hesitation? No, no. Gave way. She recalled the promise lately given to her furious husband, but a st still small voice told the lady that her visitor had feelings of a wider, higher and deeper range than her spouse. Well, there it is, Mr. Editor. Soon it shall wend its way towards your publishing house. If only life were as elegant and as wholesome as a novel, Mr. Editor, as the novels which fall plop on your desk every day, but in life, in my life, ah, what's this? I thought I posted it. Le Leyland, my old friend, sculptor and scholar, teacher of my art. I have to tell you there is a lady about whom I have high hopes, though they are much concealed. She has been until recently a married woman, but this state is no more. Her husband, my erstwhile employer, has lately shaken off this mortal coil, as Mr. Shakespeare says. I therefore wait each day, breathless, to hear from her. I wait. But she is surrounded by powerful persons who hate me. The husband has left his property in trust to the widow, provided I do not see her. If I disobey, it is to ruin her. But I dare hope she will take courage. I can make my own way in the world. Though I write about a love concealed, I tell you truly no servant could have been so dull as not to perceive the change in their calm and sweet-tempered mistress. The dove-like eye seemed troubled. The voice with its gentle tone gave way to hesitation. To tear from my heart the thousand recollections of her that rush upon me would be to steal from a newly blind man his remembrance of sunlight. Yes, yes, that's good. Leyland, old friend, I used to play with my soldiers. Now it would be disheartening to work myself up again to new battles. I have already been compelled to retreat with heavy loss and no gain. My army stands now where it did then, and I mourn the slaughter of my youth and hope. While I am writing thus, old friend and tutor, may I also mention my embarrassment with an outstanding bill at the old cock in Halifax. It is a mere three shillings, but I have been threatened with a court summons. You yourself are a valued customer. I wonder if you might reassure the landlady of my reliability in such matters. Your good and faithful friend, as ever, P.B. Bronte. But oh, there was another letter. A letter very dear to me. Wait, here it is. Oh, Lydia, my love, mistress of my heart. I have to tell you that you are a lady about whom I have high hopes, though they are very much concealed. You have been until recently a married woman, but this state is no more. 
I hope your husband, now he is freed from the dungeon of this life, as was Christian in Mr. Bunyan's tale, will receive in heaven that honour and respect for every degree, kind and appetite which is absent here on earth. Meanwhile, I wait each day breathless to hear from you. You are surrounded by powerful persons who hate me. Yet I dare hope you will take courage and reveal your true self to me. Though our love has long been a love concealed on both our parts, yet no servant could have been so dull as not to perceive the change in your calm and sweet-tempered demeanour. To tear from my heart the thousand recollections of you would be to steal from a newly blind man his remembrance of sunlight. Also, I have written a poem which I enclose. Oh, Lord, where is it? Here, here. <clears throat> I see your picture is cleverly made. Where should be sunshine, there is shade. And from your heart your smile still shine, though you have stolen all from mine. And I have sent a copy already to the Bradford Herald. I await their letter of acceptance. Your stout-hearted servant, P.B. Bronte. <laughs> Charlotte! Sister! You weep! Oh, my poor Mary Percy. Let Zamorna comfort you. I did not know you were in here. I do not need the comfort of Zamorna. I do not need the comfort of a lead soldier. Sister, what is the matter? I can help you. Do not reject me. I too have experience of misery. You? Misery? Branwell's misery? What misery is that? The misery of the desktop? The blood and tears of Toyland. Oh, were those real battles we fought here? Was this desk once stained with the live blood of the infantry? Because I look, I look and I cannot see the stains. Nor do I smell the smoke of cannon. I sniff the foggy air and smell only the sourness of gin. I have had a glass, sister. That is all. To help with my writing. I have not read your writing for many a year, brother. For now it is sealed away in an envelope and bears a postage stamp. You write letters, Branwell. Not that you ever post them. No. No. I do not write only letters. I am a man of letters. I would not want you to think I write only letters. No. No. Poems. I write poems. At this very moment, I wait on acceptance from the local paper. Poems? And what is your subject? My subject is love. A noble subject. <laughs> girls' games. Are not the games of love mere girls' games? These are no games. I do not play at love. Do you not? Does someone then play with you? I do not understand. I also do not understand. There is always love, else what will the soldiers do when they have won? They must have something to do when the battle is over. You write your letters, brother, and I write mine. And I post mine. Your letter? You mean that letter in your hand? My it... own, sent back to me. A rejection from the publisher of my heart. I said I do not understand. I will show you then. I will explain. It will not make pretty reading. It is not at all like Miss Austen. Look, it is a long time since you have read what I wrote, brother. These are the kind of letters I write. If these are words of moment, sister, if these are words close to your heart and person, then I would feel an intruder to read them. If you will not read them, I will read them to you. Your subject is love. And so is mine. And to whom do you write of your love? My professor. I do not... Understand? You keep saying so, brother. Yet I think you do understand. Else I would not bother with you. Now, listen. I have done everything. I have sought occupation. I have denied myself absolutely the pleasure of speaking about you. 
but I have been able to conquer neither my regrets nor my impatience. Is this familiar to you, brother? Does this strike a chord with your emotions, with your poetic intellect? Your professor? You mean... Monsieur Constantine, the constant one, the head of my school, where I worked and taught and learned. The monsieur? The Belgian? You have formed an attachment with a Belgian? The monsieur, yes. We all called him that. But he's foreign and a member of the Church of Rome. I have heard that Byron died a Catholic, though you would not notice from his verses. Sister, do not continue. It is unseemly that you divulge this... Passion? Liaison. Oh, and I thought you did not know your French. Strange how the English always find a French word to describe the thing of which they disapprove. But your new poem, is that in English? Of course it is in English. And the whole world may read it? Whichever part of the world buys the Halifax Guardian? It is the Bradford Herald. Touché! There. Another French word for your vocabulary. My own French is très pauvre, I'm afraid. When I write in French, the monsieur corrects my sentences. <laughs> Sometimes also when I write in English. Believe me, your English sentences are excellent. Thank you. But in my case, we speak of a poem. We speak of rhyme and metre. Assonance and alliteration, no doubt. Perhaps. Though at this moment I forget some details of the style. But not the content. You do not forget the content. I do not forget the content. The hurt. We none of us forget the hurt. This thing of yours is not a poem. This is... A letter. Naked, for a letter does not wear the garments of rhyme and, and metre. You are not a poet. You are a woman, and women... Must not talk of such things. Women must not show themselves naked, not even in words. But you have seen me naked, brother. Is that not so? When we were children... We are not children now. Are we not? I can never make up my mind about that. But yes... You were right. A letter is always naked if it is sincere. It can never pretend to be a poem. But listen how it speaks to you. It is indeed humiliating to be unable to control one's thoughts, to be the slave of regret, of memory, the slave of a fixed and dominant idea which lords it over the mind. Your last letter was a stay and prop to me, nourishment for half a year. Stop! <laughs> This is unseemly. To forbid me to write to you, to refuse to answer me, would be to tear from me my only joy on earth, to deprive me of my final privilege. Believe me, my master, so long as I believe you are pleased with me, so long as I have hope of receiving news from you, I can be at rest and not too sad. But when day by day I await a letter, and when day by day disappointment flings me back in overwhelming sorrow, then fever claims Stop. me. Stop! I lose appetite and sleep. I pine away. Stop! He sent it back. As you see, unopened. Perhaps his wife... Of course his wife! But is he not a man? Does he not have the courage? It is well that he sends it back. He has done right by you. I am your brother, and a poet. And I can see that words which may flow in perfect innocence from a young lady like yourself might with others be taken amiss. How? They might be thought to mean more than they do. They might be thought to take on a carnal aspect. A carnal aspect? Is this how modern poets write of love? And if that carnal aspect were true... Charlotte, you besmirch yourself to talk like this. Because I am not a man. Because a woman must never confess to a carnal aspect. <laughs> you are not yourself. That is the fact of the matter. You have been upset. Deeply upset. Deeply upset by this letter. But sanity will return. To which of us, brother? To which of us will sanity return? I think sometimes that pain has its own intelligence, that it seeks out those who are weak in this or that way and devises a narrow strategy for each of us. To be rejected. That was always the worst fear for me. And my pain, my very clever pain, knows this. But I have cast it down, this pain, this sorrow. I have crumpled it, and now... See... Cast it down on the floor and tread on it. Of course it's his wife. My lady is not like that. 
What? My Lydia knows my pain and comforts me. But there are others. There are those who hate me. They surround her. They whisper about me. Now her husband is dead, and I am sorry for it. For I wish no man harm. Yet I see the hand of God in it all. The hand of God? <laughs> Lydia? Your employer's wife? How alike we are, you and I. We go out into the world and we take our madness with us. It is not madness. What a vile, corrupt breed we teachers are. All of us who think we have something to give to the world. We give only our insanity. How often does she write? I tell you, there are those close to her who hate me. It is difficult for her to write. Difficult? What is there in life that is not difficult? Here, hold me. Embrace me. Hold me tight. For a moment. Only for a moment. Yes. Yes. We are still friends, it seems. Good. I thought for a while we were not. We will always be friends. We are alike. Even though you were a boy and boys have larger brains. Even so. <laughs> well, I suppose you were right. We have no secrets. <laughs> Charlotte, Emily, Anne. It is good to have my family at home. Christmas is a time for families. I am sure Branwell will be back shortly, Father. There is, I believe, some revelry in the village, Charlotte. The Christmas Eve sort that involves the men. You mean involves strong drink, mm. do you not, Emily? But I am sure he will be back tonight, Father. Or early tomorrow, in time for his presents, no doubt. I am giving him my old copy of A Christmas Carol to remind him what Christmas is about. I know the one you mean, Emily. The spine is torn, and you have penciled many comments in the margins. That is not much of a Christmas present. He will think you are Jacob Marley. Let him think rather I am the spirit of Christmas yet to come. That might do him some good. Oh, come now, ladies. Branwell is a young man, and young man no, will do it. No, no, he is not so young. He merely affects to be young. He still keeps soldiers in his drawer. You are harsh with him at times, Emily. No more than he deserves. No more than you, father. I am tired. I will drain this glass and retire to bed. I am grown old. Once I could control his ways. Once I could control your ways, daughters. Now I must let you come and go as you please. But Branwell is still my son. Welcome, my son. Welcome, my brother Branwell. Welcome. Thanks to you, father. Thanks to you, brother. Thanks to you, John. Thee has come to this our temple, my son, my brother, to receive from thy holy father and true brother the rites of initiation. Dost thou wish that? Dost thou wish to join us in the true knowledge? With all my heart. He's already been divested of whatever monies they carried, so thou comes to this temple bereft of the help and support of this world. Thou wears a blindfold to symbolize the darkness of thy past life, but also thou wears the white robe of our order to symbolize thy hope. I do. Then let the ritual begin. Thee is a poor candidate in a state of ignorance. I am. And there comes of thy own free will and accord, humbly soliciting to be admitted to the mysteries and privileges of Freemasonry? I do. Kneel. I will. Thou must know that all men are a measure of the world. I know. It is their only value and significance. So I have learnt. They reflect the perfect proportions of the great geometer. I wish he would see the error of his ways, but he has no sense of proportion. Come, Anne. It is a season of goodwill. And we do not wish to worry our father unduly. You are all of you young women of great virtue. It is sometimes it is hard for a young woman to understand the nature of a man. 
But I, though I am old and somewhat damaged by the world, I do understand Branwell. It is a phase. It will pass. It is like a wild passage in a concerto by Vivaldi. It will be replaced by a slower movement. That is the nature of music. The fast and the slow. It will calm him. No, Charlotte. Branwell only listens to the music in his head. He's not the only one in this family who does so, Emily. If you mean me, sister. I do. I did not think I cut such a dashing figure. All men are mere figures and fractions. Is not an inch the length of thy fingernail? It is. And twelve the length of thy foot? Yes, yes. And a yard is the measure of thy arm and thy leg and thy reach and thy stride? Yes. Is not a stone that weighs a pound the natural limit of thy grasp and lift? Why does the seek to lift more? I do not. But once thou did, once thou sought to move mountains. No longer. Thou's becoming a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. I renounce those ways. And what is now thy ambition? To be as all my brothers, my fellow men. To be no more than the lowest. I rejoice to hear it. I also rejoice. We should rejoice, daughters. We should not have such long faces. We should rejoice in our Saviour, who has put us on this earth to do good work. Good works? Why, yes. Our good works should be celebrated. Father! But it is never right, Anne, that we should boast of our good works. Such an action brings demerit upon them and upon ourselves. Does it not, Emily? Charlotte is right. Whited sepulchres are never pleasing to the Lord. But sometimes, when the news is good, is it not our duty to communicate it? Would it not raise people's spirits if it were known? And others might be condemned to purgatory... Better sometimes to keep secrets, sister, at least till time is ripe. Secrets? You bemuse me with your talk. What secrets can young women of virtue ever have? You jest with an old man. <laughs> this is the secret which we now share with thee, for we are entering a new age when all numbers shall be levelled and all shall be as one. I will now remove the blindfold. Look around thee, lad. Gaze upon thy new world. Though all I see is the bare room where I have pledged my new allegiance, yet to me it is the world, and it is beautiful. But do not seek to be more than thou can be. Be humble. Any help and support thou may receive can only come now as a gift from thy fellow masons. Here, let us now take God's gift of wine by which thy new life may be consecrated. Then from Wuthering Heights, sisters, but merely a paragraph. I am somewhat shy about reading more. This is certainly a beautiful country. In all England, I do not believe I could have fixed on a situation so completely removed from the stir of society. Well done, Mr. Bell. Well done. You may now placate your shyness and cease forthwith. We see from the very start of your novel that you draw strongly upon your own life and situation, sir. You could not be further removed, sir, from the stir of society than to be here with your sisters. Brothers. Brothers. Brother writers. The Bells. Ellis Bell. Acton Bell. And myself, the unknown Currabell. The Bells of the Ball. <laughs> <laughs> Do I not see in the character of your Mr. Heathcliff a reflection of your own demeanour, Mr. Ellis Bell? He is somewhat brooding, like yourself, Mr. Bell. He has that air of Lord Byron. Is it not a self-portrait, 
Mr. Bell, will it not perhaps become a bad influence on the younger generation of women? Will it not set the minds of young girls a-racing? Their hearts a-fluttering. Their hair streaming back in the wind as they run across the heather-strewn moors. Dreaming of their own, Mr. Heathcliff. <laughs> <laughs> well, sir, and what do you say to us, Mr. Ellis Bell? I do not write for young girls, sir. If they should succumb to such bestial charms... Bestial charms? Why? That is a phrase to be savoured, Mr Bell. Then for whom do you write? I write for myself, Mr Bell. How selfish of you, Mr Bell. But sometimes perhaps we must be selfish. We must do things for ourselves. We? we? Women? Do you mean women, Mr. Currabell? What do I know of women, Mr. Acton Bell? I, who am a bachelor. Come, let us hear from your own celebrated work. Let us hear from Agnes Gray. Yes, Mr. Bell. Read me the part where your Agnes decides to leave home. I like that. Mm, very well. I should like to be a governess, I said. My mother uttered an exclamation of surprise and laughed. My sister dropped her work in astonishment, exclaiming, You? A governess? Agnes? What can you be dreaming of? I am amazed, Mr Acton Bell. How can you dream so wantonly as to place yourself in the mind of a young girl? And, even more astonishing, one who wishes to be a governess. It is so far removed from your actual existence that I marvel at your powers of imagination. Come, Mr. Carabell. Was not your own book about a governess? It was. And you will recall it was rejected by your publisher, despite the promise of a generous payment from the author... Unlike your own works, which are now enjoying great celebrity. Nobody reads them. We have paid for their publication, and yet... We cannot pay the readers to read them. We had only one legacy from our poor aunt. But at least they are out in the world. At least they do not fester at home, as we do. Do you regret it, then? Would you rather spend the money on petticoats and bracelets? No, sister. I rejoice in being an authoress, and it is you who are the organiser of that. An author, Mr Bell. You are authors and you are men. And you, Mr Ellis Bell? To me it makes no difference. And yet, perhaps it was good that we should do it, even though I know not why. But you, Mr Carabell. You are the one who provoked us to this action. It is unfair that you yourself should remain unpublished. The world is never fair. Come, let us drink the health of your publisher, gentlemen. God bless the man. Surely you have not surrendered your own literary hopes, Mr Bell? No, no, I am now working on a new tale. And I will seek out a new publisher... It is about a plain girl, and I have called her Jane. I fear she is somewhat like myself. Is she a governess? I have not truly made up my mind on that score just yet. <laughs> she will be a governess, I know it. When you are published also, then we shall tell Father. You will surely allow that. But how shall we ever tell Branwell? Tell me, Mr Bell. Tell me, Mr Organiser. If we are truly to be the bells of the ball, then we must learn to enjoy our secrets, smile behind our paper fans as we gaze at the dancing crowd. Let us keep our own counsel on the matter, at least for now. I am glad Father has gone to bed. Hey there, let us in. We demand admission. Unless you be in a state of undress. Even that I by no means deplore. <laughs> we are not in a state of undress. Heaven forbid. Let them in, then. But remember, keep our own counsel. Come on in, then, but do not wake our father. Forgive us, ladies, for disturbing you. Why do men always believe they are disturbing to women, and yet apologise for it? He's right, Miss Charlotte. There are too many apologies in this world. Let us be simply as we are, with no apologies. 
I, for one, never apologise. But we are all sinners, Mr Brown, and we must sometimes apologise to God. I have brought John home with me. I can see you have brought Mr Brown home with you, or he has brought you home. I can see you have been drinking. You have both been drinking. No apologies, Miss Charlotte. But what are these on the desk? Toy soldiers? Is this your little secret, Mr Branwell? Oh, I had the same when I were a lad. I could play with these till the cows come home. Ladies, it has been a good night. Good for... Conversation. Argument. Philosophy. We have seen eternity tonight. Like a great ring of pure and endless lights. All calm as it was bright. 360 degrees as described by Euclid. I do not think our brother was talking mathematics, Mr Brown. Was he not, Miss Anne? Was I not? For what is philosophy except mathematics? What is the universe except an equation, a proof? A proof of what? Of itself, Miss Charlotte. There we must differ, Mr Brown. To me and to my family, the universe is a manifestation of the love of God, a proof of that love. And what love has he shown to thee, Miss Anne? Thee who has lost a mother and two sisters? Well, what is love? As a tennis score, it is nothing. As nothing, we can multiply it and make it scores on hundreds and thousands and millions, just by adding nout and nout and nout. You are playing parlour games. But let him, Anne, let him. I find it amusing. Yes, <laughs> amusing. Thank you, Miss Emily. What is eternity, then, if not mathematics? What is infinity? Well, I will tell thee, there is more than one infinity as there is more than one God. That is blasphemy. Mere truth, Miss Charlotte, for thou must allow that there be an infinite number of numbers in the world, for numbers, like God, have no end. But numbers are divided into odds and evens, and the number of even numbers is also infinite. Well... And for that matter... The number of odd numbers is infinite, too. Ah, I see it. Uh, I, too, see it. Indeed, I do. So we have already identified three separate infinities, have we not? And we have hardly begun. So many infinities. So many gods. Branwell. I'm sorry, Charlotte. I, I do not mean that... I this... think he was using metaphor, ma'am. I know from experience Mr Branwell is a master of metaphor. But it sometimes runs away with him. If there are many infinities, then there are many truths. Yes. Oh, thee's such a bright one, Miss Emily. All those truths. But not in the sense that Paris records are a truth. What does the calling born on such and such died so and so? And I do attach to this document my signature that is a true and accurate record. For when people die, then there is a need of Paris record truth. But epitaphs. Are they also truths? Gone to his maker. Do we know that for a parish record kind of truth? I think we do not. Loved by all. Show me a man who is loved by all, and I'll eat a sod from the graveyard. Not parish record truth at all. And all those poems, and all those novels. What truth are they, Mr Brown? For I have ambitions in that area. Does that now, Miss Emily? Why, it is any truth I could want. For a writer is like God, is he not? He makes a universe on the page, and sometimes we say, yes, it is true, it speaks to me of the world. But we know it is not Paris record kind of true. We know we cannot put our signatures there and say, this is an accurate record. Suppose, for instance, in a century's time, some writer might make a play out of all of us... <laughs> Why should he do that? But who knows, Miss Emily? I am not a writer. Perhaps he's taken against us. Taken against me. He might make me out the devil incarnate if he wanted. He might write anything he liked. And it might not bear one word of truth. Oh, yes, he might treat us all like lead soldiers. Like this one I now hold in my hand. He might play with us. Move us about. Shoot us. Bloody us. Snap off our heads. 
like that. <gasps> <laughs> Was that General Percy? Has General Percy <laughs> lost his head, Miss Emily? Like all them French aristocrats that thought they was too good for the common man. We can perhaps replace him. We can all be replaced. We are all soldiers, but thee, Miss Emily. Oh yes, I should like to read a novel written by thee. I should not be surprised if thee did not turn out to be the brightest star in the vault. That is to say, the vault of heaven, of course. Though I am a grave digger, yes, I did not mean anything so. Unfeeling as the family vault.、Uh, no offence. None taken. None at all. So numbers govern everything, Mister Brown. Not love, nor decency, nor sense of duty. Only numbers. Does not the Bible itself tell us this, Miss Charlotte? For I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and at the gates twelve angels, and on the gates the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. And the wall of the city held twelve foundations, and on them the twelve names of the twelve apostles. And are they not twelve pence in a shilling? And will that not continue till the crack of doom? It must be so. And are we not all here, ladies, to make up the ledger as the great accountant demands? And is that not enough? It is a shame, Miss Emily, that there is no music in this house tonight, for Mr. Branwell and I have been discussing music. And if there were, Mister Brown, what should we do? Why then we should dance, Miss Emily. It would wake father. Then we will dance without music. All we need are the measures. Come, Miss Emily, give me thy hands. One, two, three. One, two, three. One. You are too strange. Strange, Miss Emily. No, there is no strangeness. We are all of a muchness, are we not? All of a mean and an average. So why do we strive to be other than we are? Are we not already sufficient? Yes, it is so. No, Mister Brown. No, brother. We are not in this world to make up the numbers. We are here to show our Maker who and what we are. Yes, Mister Brown. We are here to strive. But, Sister, what hush, I... Branwell. We have heard enough of you. And you, Emily. I condemn you for your slatternly behaviour. I do not understand. Look at this room. Was it not your one chore today to sweep and tidy this room? Is this what passes for neatness in your world? Is it good? Is it right? Is it fit for a Christian family? Must we not labour far more diligently to clear away the bric-a-brac? But wait, I see you have left the broom in the corner. Bring it here. Bring you the broom, Charlotte. Very well. Here it is, Charlotte. My thanks to you, Emily. Now, you dance, Mister Brown. You enjoy the dance. You admire the Terpsichorean art. Why, yes, Miss Charlotte. Stop! My ankles. It hurts. Stop it! Stop it, Miss Charlotte. <laughs> Stop it! Stop it! I say. You are such a good dancer, Mr. Brown, especially when you have the incentive of a stout broom. And as you say, who needs music when we have the measures? And I think that I have the measure of you, sir. Miss Emily, will you not take my part? Your sister is a mad woman. She's bruised me. She has. She has made a fool of you, Mr. Brown. She has swept you away. And with what cause? I have only striven to be your humble servant. Well, we are all here to strive, Mister Brown, and now I would be happy if you were to strive to leave this house. If that is thy wish, ma'am, if that is the wish of all the other ladies, if that is the wish of Miss Emily, oh, for thee, bright Emily, for thee I would. What would you do? Why,、well, I would hang a litter of puppies. Charlotte, what has got into you? You, you have assaulted my friend. You have driven him from the house. I have tidied up. No more, no less. Come, Emily, Anne. It is late, and there will be more jollification in the morning. We must be ready for the high spirits of the day. Good night, Branwell. Good night, Branwell. Sleep well, Branwell. Good night, Anne. Good night. Emily. Good night.
Emily, listen. Plain Jane, she will be a governess. I know her well. I am good at governesses. The editor of Blackwoods. Sir, read what I write. It is right that you must. I trust you will not think me used and stale that I have already been published in the Halifax Guardian. <laughs> the Secretary, the Royal Academy. Sir, we had arranged an appointment, but there was family business. That is plain truth. I swear it. My family inquired of Mr. Turner and Mr. Gainsborough, but they would not permit me to call on you. <laughs> the directors of the Leeds and Manchester Railroad. I write to bring to your attention a very grave injustice that I will take to my grave. You see, I am talented at puns. A sum of money has been lost, lost, yes, lost forever. I will make no halt. I will be received by the lady of the mansion in the breakfast room. Breakfast is so intimate. I recall the promise lately given to my father. Where is the artillery? I was promised artillery. No mind. The battle is lost forever. Leyland, teacher of my art. There is a lady about whom I had such high hopes. I wait each day, breathless. But I am surrounded by powerful persons who hate me. And she too is lost. Lydia, teacher of my heart. I had such high hopes of you. I wait and wait. I never hoped for your husband's death. Never, I swear. I hope only for honour and respect for every degree, kind and appetite. Powerful persons watching me. Though they hate me, they will not tear from my heart the thousand recollections. They will not take from me the sunlight. Do not let it be lost, oh great editor. Also, I had written a poem and a portion of a novel which I have now lost, lost, forever lost. Where? Where? I can find nothing. I wait each day, breathless. I have been waiting so long, Father. So very long. Brother, brother, be awake. Brother, 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 be awake. <gasps> In the midst of life, we are here to mourn, but also to celebrate. We celebrate a life of talent and richness. We celebrate a life lived fully and in God's grace. The lesson for today is from Job chapter 1, verse 21. Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. Words. What do words mean? They mean anything. They mean nothing. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Give and take away. Addition and subtraction. The sums go on forever. <laughs> Blessed be the name of the Lord. My daughter, Charlotte, was the final child of mine to die. Not one of them was spared to his allotted span. Yet Charlotte has given the world her words. Writers, poets, what do they know? They fret and posture and pretend they give us meaning, but they only give us only their words. Do your work, Brown. Take up your shovel. I must speak with Mrs. Gaskell. She is even now preparing an account of Charlotte's life and the lives of her brother and sisters. 
so those lives will not be unknown, will not be in vain. For that we must be grateful. Nay, I am not grateful. I shall take comfort only in inches, ounces and gallons, the stuff of measuring, because it is they that give the only truth of this life, the things that yield measurement. It has been hard for thee, parson, all thy chickens dead. But what were they in the end but quantities, volumes, lengths, weights and capacities? A Branwell or a Charlotte? What is the difference? Another rest of us, but not the same? There's lost thy children, parson. I will be thy child. There's lost a son. I will be thy son. There's lost a wife. I will be thy wife. I will leave you now. I must converse with the mourners. With those who loved her. For what is that final number? That infinity of all the infinities? It is six foot by six foot by two. I tell you this. Every day I dig and every day I spend my hours measuring the world. And what is poetry? Only measures and metre. And what is music? Only numbers. One, two, three. 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 Miss Emily, one, two, three. One, two, three. She should have danced. She should have danced with me. She should not have refused. That was The Bronte Boy by Michael Yates, the cast. Branwell Bronte was played by Warwick St. John. Charlotte, Melanie Dagg. The Reverend Patrick Bronte, Azador Gazelian. John Brown, Eddie Butler. Emily Bronte, Vicky Glover. Anne, Hayley Briggs. Other parts were played by Colin Lewison, who also produced and directed. The Bronte Boy was an encore production. <laughs>